All right, guys, so we ended off yesterday with Rabbi Bam Murray, who said to Rabbi that basically, if you hang out with rich people, you're going to get a better benefit for yourself. And we said that at the end of the day, we used that example of Abraham with uh, Lot, that Lot uh, ran on the curtails of Abraham, and he became very, very wealthy. But we do know that, is it because that your muzzle improves, or is it because you gain knowledge, or is it because of opportunities? Probably D, all of the above. So, um, uh, yeah. So that was the last exchange before then. But now we're just going to go and examine the conversation with the first exchange. That's the next part of the Gomorrah. So Rav Hanan said, whoever submits judgment of his fellow to heaven, he is punished for his own sins first. As it says... And I just read it in last week. Sarah said to Avram, My justice is upon you, that Hashem judge between me and you. And it is written afterwards, And Avram came to eulogize Sarah and to bewail her. Okay. So what does this actually meant? Is that this was the issue uh, with himself and Hagar. But there was more to it than that. Because if you look in Bereshit, Sarah had two complaints. Okay, complaint number one is that they were both incapable of having children, naturally. And Avram prayed that Hashem should enable him to have children anyway. And God answered that prayer by giving him Ishmael through his second round Hagar. So Sarah's first complaint is that Avram should have prayed for them jointly to have a child. Not just that Avram could have had a child. Uh, because if he'd have prayed jointly, then um, uh, then she wouldn't have remained barren. Now, we don't know if Avram prayed uh, just for himself or for himself and Sarah, but obviously she felt there was something lacking in his davening that he was able to have children uh, or a child with Hagar instead of herself. So that's her first complaint. The second complaint was that Hagar, who was uh, Sarah's former slave woman, actually spoke disrespectfully to Sarah in Avraham's hearing. In other words, it wasn't when Avraham was out the room. It was within earshot. And he didn't respond. And if you remember that Avraham's argument is, look, she's my wife. She hasn't done anything wrong to me. You know, this is between the two of you. If you want to uh, like humble her with a bit of extra work, you can. And there are two opinions. The one of it is that she was given extra work, not because Sarah was personally in, um, insulted, but merely that Hagar needed to realize that there was a hierarchy. And number two, there was an opinion that uh, Sarah didn't burden Hagar with new work. It's just that now that Hagar saw herself as the wife of Avram, she thought it was beneath her. So what actually happened here is that Avraham outlived Sarah by 38 years. They were meant to die in the same year as each other. But she submitted a case against Avraham in Shemaim in heaven, and she said, let him be judge. So we learn here that if you are asking heaven to make an account, you punish for your own sins first. Now, there is a caveat to this, and that statement, however, applies only when one can attain justice on earth. In other words, what should have happened in Sarah's case? She should have submitted a complaint to the court of Shem, the son of Noah, because there was a, a base den and um, the Shiva, which uh, we learned that even Yaakov went to uh, Shem's uh, yeshiva. But there was a base den there too. So because there was an earthly mechanism for Sarah to go before the base den, she could have heard her case heard before submitting it to heaven. It was an alternative. And when a person has got no court to which he may appeal, he has no choice but to appeal to heaven. And he's not held accountable for doing so. Even when there's no court available, though, one must first inform his disputant of his plans before submitting the case to heaven. So what does this mean? Is that uh, at the end of the day, He's saying that um, it should be a case where, um, firstly, my question is, if there's no base dead, before you submit your case to heaven, can you take it before a secular court? And I would imagine you could do 
any normal mechanism necessary, the first priority is to be going to the base den. Then to say to him, if you don't um, appear before your summary judgment, I will issue a case in a secular court. If that doesn't help you, then say, I'm going to beseech Hashem to judge you. Now, today, I don't know if that would have any work, not because Hashem isn't capable, but because we're not on the level to necessarily get uh, a divine response. Okay, so the, the Gemara like, elaborates further on taking one's complaints to heaven. Rav Yitzchak said, Woe to one who cries out more than one who is subject of the outcry. So the Gemara supports this. It was taught in the Bryce that both the one who cries out and the subject of the outcry are implied in the verse. For if he shall cry out to me, this is Hashem using a capital M, I shall surely hear his outcry. My wrath shall blaze and I shall kill you. Now it's funny, it uses the word kill you in plural, meaning the term you, I shall kill you, is written uh, et chem. And it indicates that both the one who cried out to Hashem and the one who caused the cry will be punished. Um, so that's a, that's a pretty good support for that. And um, there's another teaching of Rav Yitzhak that we learned. And this one is relating to the episode of Sarah and Avimelech. And Rav Yitzhak said, Never let the curse of an ordinary person be inconsequential before your eyes. For Avimelech cursed Sarah, uh, and the curse was fulfilled in her seed. For it was said that Avimelech told Sarah regarding his gift of 1,000 silver pieces to Abraham. Now, we learned there that he didn't just take Sarah. He basically was trying to buy with the brother with a dowry, and he lost a thousand pieces of silver. He said, since you covered up the fact from me, and you did not reveal that Avram is your husband, thereby causing me this anguish, both physical and I'm sure financial and stress, it should be the will of God that you have children with covered eyes. Okay? So what does this mean? He said you covered my eyes by not saying the truth. You will have children with covered eyes. Now, if you have a look at this, simple meaning of Avimelech's statement is that the gift to Abraham will eliminate any disparaging glances that people might wish to cast in Sarah's direction. So had um, Abraham, sorry, uh, res uh, restored Sarah empty-handed, you could say something. But Avimelech actually um, uh, basically... Um, and, uh, did put a huge amount of money into it. And then he released her. But because he spent such a considerable sum, he regarded it as theft. And the same onlookers would actually be convinced that he'd been forced to return Sarah and that he, this took place through some sort of miracle. So he was saying, look, at the end of the day, um, uh, you, your son's going to be punished with this. And it was fulfilled, for it's written, and it came to pass. Guys, what do you think happened to the subject? When did it happen? Kevin, you know this. You'd suck it at the Akeda. Yes, explain to Gavin and Arthur. Uh, well, I guess I eventually wasn't home, but he thought uh, Avram nearly was going to sacrifice him before the, 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 and a, uh, a lamb appeared in the thicket. So uh, uh, that's, I don't know what's. Uh... So we learn that. Oh, yeah, Sarah died actually. When she heard of it, she actually, that's when she died. You know, when she'd heard. She did, about, she did die. Because she died at that moment, apparently. Yeah, because she thought, in fact, uh, he was sacrificed. So it was too much for her to bear. That's correct. Uh, negative energy revealed that uh, Abraham. Uh, had Yitzhak on the Akeda. But what we're saying is there was a Malach that intervened and said, do not place your hand against the lad. And obviously a ram appeared in the thicket, as Kevin said. But what happened is the Malach shed a tear for this. Yeah. And that tear Yitzhak's, eyes. Yitzhak's eyes and it blinded him. And that's why when you had Esav and Yaakov, their father was blind and they did a switcheroo where uh, Yitzchak, uh, Yitzchak gave uh, Yaakov the blessing instead of Esav, who was the first, first born. 
So how was mm. his eyesight dimmed? And it said, and it came to pass when Isaac was old, his then his eye dimmed. So it was from the Akeda when the Malach dropped the tear in there. But which is this week's parsha, which is this week's parsha exactly. But that was caused by Avi Melech say, saying to Abraham, caused you and Sarah caused um, my eyes to be dipped by not revealing the truth to me. I lost a thousand silver pieces. Your son's eyes will be dipped. So it says, never underestimate the curse of an ordinary person. A what person? Ordinary person, somebody that's not even married. But Rabbi Melech wasn't, uh, it's amazing that his words had such a powerful effect that he was, uh, that, 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 that he it's, uh, well, wasn't, it wasn't on the level of holiness of Avram and... Uh, I can give you another example. When somebody does an inadvertent killing, Arthur remembers this, and they go to the city of refuge, the mother of the Kohen Gadol would go and feed all those in the city of refuge because in case they pray that her son, the Kohen Gadol, dies, then at that particular point, they're all free to leave the city of refuge for an accidental killing or an inter inadvertent killing, let's put it that way, where there was negligence, but it was an accident. So we're saying that if these wicked people, when I say wicked, if somebody was negligent, then they can't be that righteous if they killed somebody with negligence. They can't be. So if their davening helps kill a Kohen Gadol, a Kohen Gadol, then uh, uh, surely uh, um, an actual audited curse has, has power. Do you see what I'm saying? So uh, that's why the Kohen Godel's mother brings them food, so that she ingratiates herself with the victims in the city of refuge, and they don't want the mother to lose their child. They don't want the mother to lose her Kohen Godel's son. It softens the davening. It softens the davening to where it might not have that effect of killing the Kohen Godel. Okay. So there's one last related statement. Rav Abayu said, one should always be among the pursued and never amongst the pursuers. For you have no fowl that are pursued more than pigeons and doves, and the Chumash qualified only them out of all the fowl for the altar. So what we're saying is here um, that if somebody is pursu uh, pursuing you, right, and they're going to harm you, literally or figuratively, and you can escape him, by turning the tables and pursuing him. You should nevertheless resist the temptation to do so. What you should rather choose, if you can, is to be neither the pursuer nor the pursued. In other words, if you can escape, you can escape. Um, and that uh, because the, uh, birds of prey are the pursuers, they're not kosher. Only birds that are pursued, or certainly not aggressors or assailants, are kosher birds for the altar. So there's a couple of things that you can learn from here. Yeah? It's far better to be a victim than an assailant, but the Torah isn't allowing you to be a victim because you have the concept of a roid in Sanhedrin. If somebody's coming to kill you, you kill them. You kill them first. It's self-defense. Um, now, the question arises that I have with this is what happens if you know the person that you're dealing with Will not stop. Let's look at Cain and Abel. Cain and Hevel. What happened is uh, uh, Cain tried to kill Hevel and uh, Hevel overpowered him. And Gavin, what happened is uh, the brother whose uh, offerings were accepted overpowered his brother and let him go. And what did his brother do? Killed kill him. So if you do with somebody that you know, if you let go, is going to keep coming back to you. I don't know what the right thing is to do. I would probably kill them. If I if I knew my life was in, even if my life wasn't in danger at that point, I probably would kill them. How many goes? After how many goes? Would they keep coming back to you? Would you get in three chances <laughs> and that's it? <laughs> Gav, Gav, I, I would tr I'd try and talk reasoning with them, but if I had if I if I had a feeling that they were going to kill me, I'd kill them first without a Did you watch that video I sent you, Damon? That thing of that road rage incident with the guy yeah. hit the over the 
Pressure, did you see it? Did you watch yeah, it? Yeah, but it wasn't as straightforward as that because the other guy grabbed him first. Physically. Yes, so he feared, I don't know, it's, uh, so maybe he feared for his life. That's where he clapped the with a pressure on it. I don't know. I don't know. Listen, he then went to go and help him afterwards. Yeah, yeah, that's, you see, that's what, that's what happened. That's anger. Anger leads to irrational. Yeah, so you know what? It could happen. That incident could happen to anybody. Just it's a bit better when, when somebody's remorseful after they've done something wrong. It's just a hundred percent better than when they're not remorseful. Yeah. You know what? You're absolutely right, Gavin. And that's the difference between a Jew and a, a, a Goy is that a Yid, when you're on the ground, we had this discussion the other night, and a person's yeah. unconscious, a Yid would generally uh, stop at a certain point and just get the person off their back. But, uh, uh, you know, there are certain cases where other people just don't stop and they keep kicking the person on the ground. That's for sure. Um, listen, Gavin, it says in Sanhedrin 72a, I'm reading a commentary here, that if a person is coming to kill you, you should intercept him and kill him first. Yeah. Yeah. Roy de, Roy de. Yeah, but uh, my thing of Roy if I stretch it a little bit. Even if he wasn't coming at that minute, I would consider like why take a chance. Um, but it's a problem. I'm not saying I'm right. All right, guys. So we're going to return to a different part of the mission now, and I'm just going to share my screen and show you where it is. You guys will probably recognize it. Give me a second. Um, now, uh, Gavin, you want to read the bottom part. The Mishnah turns to a case. The, mix, the Mishnah turns to cases, that line, eh? Yeah. In which one person invites someone else to damage him. Just move the, the, the mouse pointer away. Uh, thanks. Uh, if, one see, if one says to his fellow, blind, bar me, cut off my hand, um, or break my leg and fellow, and the fellow did so, the assailant is liable to pay for the damage despite the explicit invitation. Even if the first person added in, added on the condition that there will be no liability, excuse me, the assailant is never less liable. If one says to his fellow, tear my garment or break my jug, and the fellow did so, the damager is liable to pay for the damage. If, however, the owner added on condition that there'll be no liability, then the damager is not liable to pay for the damage. The Mishnah concludes, if he said to his fellow, do this to so and so, on condition that there will be no liability, the fellow is liable. With, whether he assails the victim's body or damages the victim's property. Okay, so we see a bit of a contradiction. Because if he says, uh, if he told the fellow, to blind his eye, or cut off his hand, or break his leg, is liability uh, despite explicit invitation. Even if he says on condition that there'll be no liability, he's nevertheless liable. Okay, but now we juxtaposing that with a contrary statement, dealing with not a person's body but a person's property, a garment, a jug, etc. The damage is liable to pay for the damage. But if the owner added on condition that there will be no liability, the damage is not liable to pay for the damage. So we see a stark contrast between assaulting somebody's body or, or damaging somebody's property. But the Mishnah's last statement is a little bit puzzling. Why? Because if he said to his fellow, do this to so-and-so, now we're talking about a third party, on condition that there, there will be no liability, the fellow is liable whether he assails the victim's body or whether he damages the victim's property. That bottom part is obvious. You cannot yeah. give somebody a head to damage somebody else. You can't do it. You can't do it. Um, that's, it's that's like a hitman. It's basically a hitman. You're hiring a hitman to take somebody out. Yeah, or to or to at least uh, damage his property. You you cannot, uh, You yeah, because... Why is the person liable? We learned a case there can be no agent through transgression, meaning the person that decides to take on that case is the person that caused the actual damage. They knew that Hashem ordered to the contrary that nobody's body or property should be damaged. 
So that person can't say, don't worry, you're not liable. He can only make that claim with his own property, uh, but not even with his own body, because it's not his body, as Gavin told us last before. Shem gave it to us. Okay. So, now that we've done that, um, the Gemara asked, Rav Asi Bachama said to Rabbi, what's the difference between the first part of the Mishnah and the last part? Why is the victim's explicit stipulation of non-liability effective when speaking about damaging his property, but not when speaking about damaging his body? So the Gemara offers an explanation. Rabbi said to Rav Asi Barhama, in the first part, the case of bodily damage, the stipulation is not effective because a person does not forgive damage to the tips of his limbs no matter what he says. So what we're saying is here, this particular um, rabbinic explanation is not because Hashem said no. It's very interesting. There are three takes. We're going to quote three different rabbinic. It's because when he told the other guy to blind his eye and not to worry about the liability, he could have been speaking out of anger. He could have said, yo, go ahead, take my eye out, see if I care. And then it ended up with screams. So that's... Uh... <laughs> the second statement is, uh, he might have said in anguish, he says, everybody hates me, why don't you just go and break my leg now? You know, and, and some, some well-meaning mm. person decided to enthusiastically assist. So we Why say, would they want to even do that? That's it's not normal to go and break some, to injure someone seriously. Why would they even, even if they got permission? Why would someone even want to do that? Kevin, if people had common sense, if people had common courtesy, <laughs> people were normal. If people were calm, the courts wouldn't be full. <laughs> am, am I right? We wouldn't have Baba Kama. Why would you damage anybody's property if you were normal? Why? And isn't it obvious if you damage, you need to fix and replace? Sure. We're not dealing with normal here. The majority of people are not normal. They just haven't been incarcerated yet. That's well, yeah, the last. If, if you look at any of us, and probably the average Jewish person, the type of theft that they got involved with was maybe like one or two cows, you know, small little stuff. But then you get the massive stuff being done by some of the goyim. They were all used as well doing it. But huge amount, which is absolutely... Listen, unfortunately, problem. when we go bad, we go bad. The cases of Jordan Belford uh, that uh, stole hundreds of uh, millions from uh, people that uh, invested in his penny stocks. There are uh, numer numerous cases of... Uh, Ponzi schemes. Ponzi schemes, Bernie Madoff. When we go bad... Bernie Madoff, the main one. Yeah, we can, Jeffrey Epstein, we've got uh, Harvey Weinstein, we've got some people that when we go off the derrick, uh, we can really do it top notch. And the reason being is it's yeah. described as a battery, is that Jewish people, if they're operating at a million watts and the average guy is operating at 50,000 watts, when we go wrong, we're going to do it big time. Like the gangsters, the Jewish gangsters in the 30s and the 40s, we're really, really going to not put half measures. So, but the truth of it is what we do have is we say, how do you know a Jew's uh, yichus? If he's got bushel uh, and sniot and modesty. Oh, bushah. Bushah, sorry, bushah, uh, sniot. Uh, modest, uh, sniot is like physical modesty for a woman, but bushah is also humility. It's, it's like a sense of modesty of self. Yeah, shame. Uh, shame, a case of of just uh, consideration of others, etc. Chesed and Rachamim. So those are, are genuinely Jewish uh, traits. So listen, the Gemara objects because Rav Asa Bachama said to Rabbi, look, if you're looking at the same logic, would a person forgive his pain caused by an injury? Obviously not. But we know because he, because basically Rabbi said to Rav Asi Bachama, listen, nobody's going to forgive the pain and uh, um, uh, damage that he goes through, when he tells the other person to injure him, he's obviously not of sane mind himself. And the person that injures him, uh, if he's happy to oblige, he's, he's responsible. But we've got a problem because we've got a, a Bryce that states the opposite. 
It says, if one says to his fellow, hit me or strike me, adding on condition that there'd be no liability, the silent is not liable. So he's saying, Rav Asi Baham is saying to Rav, well, how do you reconcile our Mishnah with this contradicting Brysa? Because apparently a person's stipulation of non-liability should be taken seriously, even if it concerns physical pain. So Rabbi had an interesting response. He was silent. Okay. And eventually he asked Rav Asa Bar Chama, well, I don't know. He said, do you know anything about this issue? So Rav Asa Bar Chama said to him, this is what Rav Shesh she says. The assailant is liable for bodily injury, even though the victim exempted him. Because blinding an eye, etc., results in a deficit and a disgrace for the victim's family. Because if you blind somebody, now who's going to be the breadwinner, right? And it's a disgrace for the family. And the victim has no right to waive that if other people are affected from damage that uh, his, uh, his statement makes. So a person can waive liability for the pain of being stricken, interestingly. Not for the damage, but the pain, since that does not involve a permanent disability or disgrace to the family or a cost uh, or a uh, cost of income or any sort of loss. So even according to Rav Sheshes, who exempts the assailant from liability for causing pain, it remains forbidden for the assailant to strike the victim in any way. Why? Deuteronomy chapter 25, verse 3. Forty lashes shall he strike him and he shall not add. So that's uh, that's clear. Okay. So before we go to a three-way point in this discussion on the different Rabonim, I would like Kevin to teach us, and we can take that on Saturday night. Okay. So there's just something from the parasha. I've got, I've got something to read here, but something very interesting also, which is a bit contradictory and weird. Uh, it's in this week's parasha, the angels go to Sodom, and they were, and they, and Sodom was a very selfish society, and the word Sodom, like to sodomize, comes from there. That's what. The men used to do. Uh, I know that's uh, that's exactly what they did. And they, they people were not allowed to be keep, keep hospitality. If they were, they were killed, or they maybe they were sodomized. But it, they were. Uh, it was a very cruel, selfish uh, society. And Lot uh, hosted an angel, and the angel was uh, going to was there to warn him that the, the city was going to be destroyed. Which was eventually was by self uh, downpour, sulfurous rain, and they they came to his door. They came to Lot's door. These uh, the, the townspeople, and then Lot tried to appease them, and he offered them his daughters. Now yeah, that I don't understand. Eh? That's bizarre. Yeah, but then but that's just very the, the strange. That's not the strange thing. The strange thing is that he had son-in-laws. Now it doesn't say in any of the commentaries. That the son-in-laws agreed to that and when lot decided to leave the son-in-laws didn't go with so why would lot have offered his daughters to the mob if they were married that's the question why would he or unless the son-in-laws agreed to it doesn't say well, anything there damon do you know the story uh, is there do you know have you heard about this um um Yes, I, I've, I've heard of some of it. I mean, like for example, it says that uh, Lot's generosity of spirit was misdirected. And Abraham, there was chesed with an understanding of contextual relevance. Whereas when Lot offered his daughters, you see, Lot, Lot basically was hospitable. And what happened is the townsfolk went to him. Because what they used to do is they would stretch you on a rack if you were too short for the bed. Or chop off your limbs if you were too long so that you would never come back to the place again. And the reason um, the reason why they did that is because that was a very wealthy place and there was no space for kindness and charity for those that couldn't pull their financial weight. So what happened is um, that they basically had no consideration for the poor, the passing strangers, no hospitality, etc. So the problem is um, they won't even sell you food or water. They don't want you there. Okay. So they found out that Plitith, Lot's daughter, had secretly given food to a stranger who was near starvation. That's what happened. And they burned her in public. 
okay? And then there was another time when they discovered that a young girl had fed a starving beggar. Now, we learned the story. And they smeared honey all over her. They stripped her of her clothing. And they placed her upon the city wall, and she died from the bee sticks. So it was an act of, of humiliation because of her nakedness and from the sting of bees. That wasn't Lot's daughter. It was another young girl who fed a starving beggar. But they did many similar heinous acts of cruelty. So when um, Lot's daughter had given food to a stranger, they were now going to kill Lot and everybody. So be, to pacify the mob, Lot threw his daughter out. And then they burned her. Otherwise, they all would have been killed. What a hero. I would throw they had three daughters him. then. Yeah, he had three. He had three daughters, and as you can two, see, yeah, uh, this is this is definitely a character trait of Ishmael, where they can send their children. Yeah. Uh, uh, ah, yeah, 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 yeah. They put the they, they hide behind the children, though. and it shows the level level of, of, of depravity. If someone's prepared to give his own daughters an irrationality, but the question is, what did the son-in-laws? They were married. Why would the son-in-laws have agreed to that? Maybe well, they did. No, well, the truth of it is they were all going to get killed, and maybe they weren't very good husbands, and they figured they'd remarry. You know, that's... And they were prepared to. Maybe they were prepared to go along with it. it didn't Lot, bother them. Hang on a second. Lot had been sitting at the gates of Sodom. He saw two strangers, and he knew he was risking his own life. Okay, but he did pick up a character trait of Avram in terms of. Chesed. He never forgot yeah. completely where he was, uh, and he didn't share their cruel treatment.